Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. You are excited about our next guest coming on the programme. Not nearly as excited as I am. Thrilled that he's going to be on. When I mentioned it today, a lot of you sending me messages, wishing him well. You've seen him on RT. You've seen him on press TV. You've read him. He's done national and international radio. He's a former intelligence officer and translator for the US Air Force, the National Security Agency, and the Directorate of National Intelligence. Uh, I've come across him many times researching various topics, various geopolitical things happening have come across his excellent and well thought out opinions. Let's welcome to the programme it's a real thrill, Scott Rickard Scott, thanks for taking the call how are you? Hey Richie, thanks for having me on, I really appreciate it Hey, The pleasure is mine, we, we've, um, we've got a lot of mutual friends, one of them being Ray McGovern who was on the show the other day Ah, oh, fantastic guy, you uh, you couldn't have a, a better guest on your show uh, just tremendous uh, truth teller and uh, has a great perspective and extremely honest about uh, what he's experienced and observed in the in the geopolitical realm yeah he is he's great and i know you know ray well scott there's so much that we can get into in the 45 minutes we have and one of the things that our listeners were really keen to hear you talk about something you've lectured on many times and you might be fed up of it but yeah. um, but it's but it's very important because uh we I, i've had the pleasure at certain times over the year, talking to people like Ray and others, um, we talk about these events that happen in countries in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Ukraine, in Syria, these revolutions. Out of the blue, uh, a bunch of people uh, say that they're being oppressed, they're being put down, democracy hasn't reached them, the government is tyrannical and the government needs to go. Before we know it, we have a revolution, a so-called revolution. We have a big uh, battle between government uh, agents of the government, namely the police and, and, and the army. And before we know it, our governments in the West are telling us that there is a tyrannical regime that needs to be dealt with. You speak very eloquently, and you have done many times, about the origins of these colour revolutions. Uh, and they originate basically where you and I live, Scott. They originate here, they originate in the United States. And tell us about how non-governmental organisations are used as a cover to fund these uh, so-called revolutions. This is fascinating stuff. Well, obviously, the uh, um, the different political realms have their ties into the financial communities, and they create these um, uh, even government-related organizations like USAID is a very powerful um, uh, what what is should be considered an NGO. Unfortunately, it's heavily funded by the U.S. government, but there are also just uh, hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of other non-government organizations. And I say that very loosely because they're heavily funded by governments and individuals who are uh, co-opting and, and corrupting our governments. And these, these go you know, into the deepest cells of you know, places like in England where you are. The Chatham House is, a, is a, a, like the, sort of the tip of the spear. And there's just uh, multiple, uh, um, multiple types of uh, uh, organizations in and around uh, uh, England, especially in and around Sweden. Uh, the Swedish and the English have been uh, allies for some 500 years now. They have great uh, um, uh, initiatives to uh, defame and uh, victimize and and really vilify uh, Russia, their traditional enemy. They've been absolutely good about uh, pulling the Americans into that same uh, realm in the 1850s. And the Americans, as unfortunately, f- fell in lockstep with the uh, the British Empire and the French Empire and overthrowing the uh, uh, what would would have been a color revolution at the time if they wanted to call it that the uh, the Spanish empires. So you know this has gone on. You know Portugal had the, uh, one of the first ones, uh, the Carnation Revolution, and then you had the Philippines where the Americans were involved there. And in fact, uh, I was um, I was working uh, in Southeast Asia as a Korean linguist uh, uh, at that uh, um, just prior to that uh, that revolution. Believe me, the Americans were very much in control. Alongside their petro puppet uh, um, allies, uh, believe it or not, Saudi Arabia is one of the major holders of the petroleum industry in the Philippines. So and then you have, you know, obviously the Velvet Revolution, we're all pretty familiar with, and the uh, um, and Czechoslovakia, then you had Yugoslavia, and you had uh, many, many others that followed. Uh, one I like to talk about the best is, uh, you know, because I think it's more apropos to what's happened in Ukraine. 
uh, twice now, uh, once with the Orange Revolution and uh, certainly more recently with what they never really gave a color, but it was uh, the Maidan Square. Um, the, uh, the, the Rose Revolution was uh, really the beginning of the end, uh, right after the Americans and the NATO allies agreed to not go after former Soviet states. They immediately uh, sent in uh, Saakashvili, uh, who uh, um, is now their puppet in Ukraine, uh, who was really American trained. And, uh, and sent in as the youngest um, f uh, foreign minister in the history of, uh, of Georgia and overthrew a, a, an actually a, a very decent man, Eduardo, Eduardo Chevernazzi. Uh, he was uh, uh, quite a, 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 a fair statesman when he was dealing with the West under G Gorbachev. So it was, you know, just the, 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 the connections to George Soros and, and George Soros with these uh, just hundreds of NGOs that have been operating now for, you know, a couple of decades. Hey, Scott, been... do, you want to, do, you want, do you want to just spend a bit of time talking about George Soros? Because strangely enough, he's, his name occasionally comes up on this program, but we never right. delve too deep into who this guy is. It must be said for our listeners, uh, he's, a, he's a fund manager, uh, an 85-year-old man. He's arguably one of, if not the wealthiest people on planet Earth. He's connected to the National Endowment for Democracy. And Tell us more about this. Who is this George Soros? Well, George Soros, you know, he, he's just one, one man. I and mean, don't get me wrong, he's, not, he's, not, he's, he's just the tip of the spear. Is, there's many, many, many out there that are in his, uh, his same realm. Uh, this is a you know, uh, see, the, the Hungarians uh, had a good axe to grind, uh, you know, with uh, the, the West and with uh, with what happened uh, with the uh, um, uh, the takeover by the Soviet Union. And a lot of the individuals that came in and escaped the uh, um, the Soviet Union when uh, at post-World War II uh, were very much, uh, um, you know, against, uh, you know, what uh, what the West had allowed to happen there. And there was a lot of uh, individuals in the West that were very sympathetic and so george soros because of his financial ties uh and and, and it ties into many other people uh, if you look at uh, um uh, leslie deek uh it's on my facebook page i talk about him his father uh was actually also hungarian uh deeks uh, was uh, um a uh, uh working for the cia to um basically uh um, subvert uh not only nations but also governments and uh, uh militaries around the world uh alongside the CIA he's the one that helped create the Krugerrand uh, before he was murdered in his office uh in Connecticut uh, uh but his son carried the torch and continued to work with uh, um uh basically mafioso individuals like Semyon Mogilevich who were very anti-Soviet and anti-Russian uh, now, Mogilevich has, uh, you know, sort of moved alongside uh, through the gas and oil industries in Russia, and he provides all the security for the pipeline infrastructure. Uh, but by far, he is the most uh, unknown and, and uh, probably the most successful uh, um, mobster in the history of the world. The guy's worth over $15 billion, actually uh, about the same wealth as uh, George Soros, uh, but he's what I would consider the uh, dark side of the Jewish mafia. Scott, are you, are you, sorry to interrupt, are you describing here, this is, this is vital stuff, this, are you describing the actual hidden hand? Because we yeah, talk about is, the hidden hand, is, these this, are this the people. Hand, this hidden yeah. hand is, is, is out in the open. These are the faces, never yeah. Discussed. Well, we never discuss, we never, we never hear these names. You never hear his name. His name is Semyon Mogilevich. He is the most powerful mobster in the history of the world, and he is a partner of, uh, of the West. He has been an enemy to Russia, and now he's back in Russia uh, because of the uh, um, obviously the fall of the uh, um, the KGB that wanted him out of there. Now the FSB and the sort of kinder, gentler uh, uh, Putin uh, um, uh, regime, he's uh, um, he's able to survive. And in fact, he was indicted in 2002. I welcome anyone to go to the FBI's website in the United States, FBI.gov. And search for Semyon Mogilevich. Uh, he has been indicted for 13, 14 years now uh, because he frauded the U.S. and Canadian stock exchanges uh, when he was uh, a, a, a partner and arms dealer alongside the CIA. Uh, and he was really instrumental in providing weapons uh, when the Americans and their allies uh, alongside uh, um, the Pakistani and the Afghanis were at war with Russia. So it's a very interesting web uh, where this individual 
has you know ties into uh, not only the Soros uh, um, mentality, but uh, you know these are individuals who are you know obviously very anti um, uh, Russian establishment. Uh, you know very much like if you look at Brzezinski, you know I'd put him in the same basket, uh, a Polish guy. So you have a you know basically a, a, a Hungarian, a Pole, and a Ukrainian, all fairly much from the same region of uh, southern uh, Russia. And uh, um, so, and you have these individuals who are absolutely very anti uh, Russian establishment who have incredibly great ties uh, in the U.S. government, uh, uh, you know, through one through the intelligence community and mob mob related sides, another through the financial and another one through the defense. What so you're these- describing, Scott, is really, really incredible. You have guys like Mogilovich, who is or has been wanted by. Uh, the FBI, but at the same time, well, let's let's use the term "wanted" very very loosely, loosely exactly because identified by. identified by the <laughs> FBI. But at the same time, he's working with very very shadowy elements of the U.S. government. At the same time, well, I don't think he's working with them any longer. I think that uh, his uh, his days were uh, cut short uh, in the early two thousands. Uh, but he he is absolutely uh, um, tied into the same networks. Uh, that are, you know, extremely instrumental in not only dictating uh, and and um, uh, sort of steering uh, the uh, geopolitical affairs. Have you noticed how no pipelines have been bombed in Ukraine? You know, that's there's no accident for that. Uh, if you if you mess with any of Mr. Mogilevich's pipelines, you can guarantee that you you won't have to fear the Russians or the Americans. You have to fear Mogilevich. So uh, yeah. On Soros, by the way, a number of our uh, uh, listeners, uh, their, their ears have pricked up as we've been talking about him. A number of them have said that that Soros has been an enemy of the Jewish lobby in D.C. and that he's an anti-Zionist. How do you respond to that? Oh, that's absolutely untrue. He's, a, he's an incredibly strong Zionist. Uh, he is a, um, he's, a, he's really a progressive, uh, he's more of a progressive liberal Zionist. He's uh, very much like, uh, um, say, Hillary Clinton's uh, um, "quote unquote" prog- progressive side. They're more. He's a neoliberal. Uh, he's absolutely uh, um, very much. Uh, he's like Bernard Henri Levy uh, is in uh, um, in France. You know, he's very much in the, the front of the uh, geopolitical affairs. From a uh, um, you know, this guy's a he's a he's a LSE grad. You know, another London School graduate. And he's, uh, you know, these are individuals who have, you know, tremendous access uh, to the highest levels of government and make some extremely uh, um, uh, instrumental moves, uh, both financially and, you know, this this guy's, uh, you know, basically move money around where he's, you know, he's had major effects on banks in England and Europe and the United States. Particularly England, uh, of course, famously. You're absolutely sure. right to say that. I mean, I, I was just reading out the tweet in the interest of fairness. I know exactly who uh, George Soros is. Uh, there, there's there's no two ways about that. We, 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 we've got Scott Rickard on the show. It's 20 minutes past the hour. What's amazing is um, William Engdahl, a few years ago, now you'll know William pretty well, I'm sure. sure. sure, sure. William spoke to me on television in London, and he was able to prove, and I thought this was incredible, Scott, and this was at a a real moment of education for me when I was learning about these dark actors, as we call them, these people you never hear of, these um, billionaire, trillionaire even, you could say, maybe not trillionaire, but multi-billionaire globalists, uh, these power brokers, the ones we never hear, the shadowy uh, elite, and William was telling me about, and he, he said, Richie, I'm going to show you that what's even more sickening about these so-called colour revolutions is how they've, they've not even tried to hide how they are staged and how they are managed, even down to the literature that spread amongst the would-be revolutionaries in terms of what to wear, what to carry, how to behave. Instruction manual, Scott. And I couldn't believe it, but he was absolutely right. Yeah, I mean he's he's absolutely right. Uh, William is a is a great analyst. Uh, he's made uh, incredibly uh, um, accurate uh, depictions of not only George Soros but you know many other yeah. scenarios. This is a this is a a great resource for anyone who's looking to expand their knowledge on you know the reality of some of the scenarios that are you know really much glossed over or ignored. Uh, you know, throughout the uh, the, the standard, uh, you know, media and education that we're given. I like to use the example in the United States uh, 
we were all raised uh, in, you know, for the last four generations since the early 1900s, uh, we were all raised on these uh, books called the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, when, and when in, in fact, this book was actually authored in Cambridge and printed in Oxford and sold on credit to Americans by a British in, immigrant and has been, and at the time was the largest volume of books ever printed in the history of the world. Uh, and, and sadly, you know, as a student myself and my parents and my grandparents, we all grew up uh, thinking it was the, uh, the, the actually the unequivocal truth of the past. And uh, unfortunately, what I find out is it is the, the British version of history and uh, the Americans were, you know, led down a, a path of, uh, you know, really, uh, and, the, and the English uh, individuals and the Scottish and all of their, you know, uh, colonies, you know, the, the Canadians, you know, everyone was fed this, uh, you know, this, you know, BS, uh, and uh, we, all, we all believed it. And, you know, when, in fact, you take the time to do your own research and, and find out the exact uh, way that history did come about, you understand that uh, um, it was very, um, uh, I guess, tainted uh, in history in the uh, favor of uh, the British and the, uh, the French and the American empires. Absolutely so it, right. Do, do you know yeah. what? There's loads of tweets on this. Um, Wayne was on to say, is it not true? Ultimately, these factions are owned by the few and they are tools to manipulate uh, current and future affairs. Natalie was on to say, when, how you doing, Natalie? When Scott mentioned the Philippine Revolution, was he referring to Cory Aquino's uh, people power toppling the Marcos regime? Is that what you're referring to? Well, no, there was that one as well. 86 was the, the time frame. Cory Aquino, it was, uh, yeah. it, was, it was at the time of Marcos. But uh, yeah, that that was uh, it was definitely uh, in that in that scenario. But the uh, the, the kinds of in scenarios that uh, that go down are not as associated with the uh, um, the the leadership. Because obviously Marcos was a another puppet of ours. Uh, you know, our our puppets come and go. Uh, you know, saw what happened in Egypt. Uh, you know, three different leaders in the in the last uh, you know few years here. And, and, you know, we have a hand in all those players and, you know, we were actually trying to bring in the head of the intelligence, uh, who was our, uh, you know, was basically doing our rendition for us in Egypt. We were taking people there and chopping fingers off uh, with somebody we were trying to put in place. So, you know, we, we don't have, you know, the Americans alongside their allies, they're not alone in this, uh, especially the British, unfortunately, uh, the British and the Americans are the two, uh, you know, most, uh, um, uh, you know, horribly, uh, uh, I guess aggressive and uh, in control. They, you know, uh, the British have been absolutely in control of the high seas uh, uh, for you know hundreds of years, and obviously uh, um, with the Spanish uh, departure and the uh, and the minimization of uh, of France, uh, you know, the Americans and the British have uh, have had you know pretty much carte blanche uh, for the last uh, half century or so. So I, it's a it's a it's a very uh, serious uh, um, uh, offense, uh, you know, that's being occurred. And, you know, the British have had, you know, uh, quite the hand. You know, you look at the I like to use the drug uh, um, interdiction, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, farce as a as a good analogy as well. If you look at the uh, uh, the, Ch uh, the Chinese uh, opium wars. Uh, you know, where the British were at war, uh, you know, for hundreds of years with the Chinese and the, op the opium was being consumed mostly by the Chinese. Now the Americans, unfortunately, are the largest consumers of opium uh, in the world. We consume 60 percent of the world's uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, but we only make up 5 percent of the world's population. That's amazing so that, stuff. It's an amazing yeah, stat and it's yeah, totally I, true. Yeah. Yeah. Do and sadly do your research. And, uh, you know, we have a society where. You know, 10 percent of our uh, society, the, the women uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexually abused as children and are drug addicts because of it, because of the psychological breakdown in a society that, you know, calls itself exceptional, but has, you know, 100,000 rapes a year, 30,000 murders a year and 10 percent of its society that's on drugs because of, uh, you know, child uh, sexual abuse. So they, these are the statistics of a society that is uh, absolutely gone about, you know, the destruction of the planet to, uh, you know, pillage its resources and uh, with the helping hand of its, uh, um, of its big brother that not only um, uh, nurtured and created the society, but has steered it in its own use as well since the 1850s uh, with the, uh, the financial and the uh, geopolitical and military ties.
Scott, it's 26 minutes past the year. We've got Scott Rickard on the show. He's a trained translator and a former intelligence officer for the NSA, the US Air Force, and the Directorate of National Intelligence. Terrific to have him on. Loads and loads and loads of tweets and emails on this. Uh, massive amounts. We're getting swamped by them. Alex oh, was on to say, it's great, yeah. You can raise children to believe anything, says Alex. They'll grow to Absolutely. adults and they'll think it's true just because they've heard it. Shona was on to say, those who win the wars write the history. There's nothing truer than that. We know Absolutely. this to be true. We could have a whole debate or a whole conversation on what is being taught in history classes uh, around the world uh, today to children. And what isn't being taught to them is, is of course, uh, probably a more relevant thing to say. Uh, tweet at Richie Allen Show. Email Richie at RichieAllen.co.uk. We're going to take a 60-second break. When we come back, we're going to ask Scott a question that doesn't get asked too often. When people like Viktor Yanukovych, when guys like him are under threat from external dark actors working for uh, other governments who want to dethrone him and want to plunge his country into disarray, why have people like Yanukovych and others not been able to do anything about that? Surely they must have known it was coming. Scott, think about that. We'll okay. take a quick break and we'll come back with more uh, from Scott Rickard. I'll give you all the information, by the way, on where to find Scott online. Terrific stuff. 27 minutes past the year. Don't go anywhere. Do you want to release the full potential of your soul consciousness and find out how to experience that power in all areas of your life now? Go to livingasyoursoul.com for free guidance with in-depth how-to articles free healing meditations of creation recordings, free soul solutions, and much, much more. Livingasyoursoul.com Making the profound practical. NeonNettle.com A new voice in alternative media. For unfiltered news at your fingertips, visit NeonNettle.com The UK's number one alternative news site. In association with the Richie Allen Show, neonnettle.com. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Welcome back to the programme, 29 minutes past the year. I've just been chatting with Scott um, off air there. And we've been lamenting, haven't we? Um, yeah. the, the, the size of the MSM, the mainstream media, the money it has to play with. You mentioned Sean Hannity there of Fox News, uh, an incredibly wealthy man, groomed, uh, coiffured, sits there on a nightly basis and pathologically lies to the American people, Scott. This is what we're up against. Well, unfortunately, uh, I don't think that he's doing it uh, deliberately. I think that he actually, you know, some of these people actually, uh, you know, drink their own Kool Aid, and uh, yeah, there's uh, there's there's no um, there's no shortage of that. Unfortunately, you know, there's it's a very disgruntled, uh, very angry, a uh, very non-apologetic society. So there are, you know, many many people with axes to grind, and. Uh, and they have no idea what kind of suffering is going on outside of their own, uh, I guess, uh, um, uh, little sphere of influence. And when it comes to, you know, Hannity and, and even Megyn Kelly, I, I was uh, uh, workmates uh, with uh, her husband before they got married. And, uh, you know, this is somebody who, you know, every once in a while has a, uh, um, I guess, a, a voice of reason uh, once in a while on Fox News, of all places. She's a lawyer, and, Scott, isn't she? I believe she's a lawyer by, by she, trade. She was a yeah. lawyer when they met in Washington, D.C., and she decided to become a, uh, a an announcer, a news announcer. And obviously, you know, she's she's quite, uh, you know, she's, she's quite good at uh, what she does. Unfortunately, she's uh, not very reasonable in her analysis, and, and uh, her and her husband are very staunch uh, – uh, sort of blue blood uh, Republicans uh, in the United States. And you know, when you have friends like Sean Hannity and uh, Bill O'Reilly, you know, it's uh, that birds of a feather thing is is, is very easy to, uh, you know, uh, take on their uh, their their bad habits. And 
as you know, when you have that kind of uh, um, re relationship, you know, that, and the kind of money that's coming in and, and it's really a privileged lifestyle, you know, you do become a bit pompous and you do become a bit, uh, uh, think that you're, um, you know, uh, know more or have better access than others. And I think you lose, uh, you lose touch with the, uh, the reality of, uh, uh, of the actions and the consequences of the, uh, of what, you know, what, what you're actually saying and, and who you're actually influencing and, you well, get I think ugly, ugly, ugly representation like uh, Donald Trump, where he's just basically riling up the savages and uh, and creating a, a, just a horrific mess uh, with a, another, you know, dynamic in the American uh, um, society that has to be uh, resolved. I think that's a fair analysis of people like Hannity and O'Reilly. I really do. I uh, appreciate that, Scott. We're we're going to talk in probably ten minutes' time. We're going to talk about where. Where is it all leading? Where, where you think things are going, and what ultimately the end game will be for people? We talked about mm -hmm. obviously the drugs, and we'll get into that and more besides. But that question, I think, is an excellent question coming in just before we took the break. There, the the likes of Bashar al-Assad. Now, for example, we can talk Yanukovych, of course, as well. Now, sure. Bashar al-Assad. By the way, folks, you can do your own research, as Scott quite rightly said, and you will find out that in the, when Bashar al-Assad came to power, he came to power as a reluctant replacement for his brother, who was due to take over from his dad. His brother died in a car crash. And Bashar is, a, is an ophthalmologist. He's an eye doctor. A uh, smart guy. Spent a lot of time in England. Uh, pretty reasonable guy. Very well spoken. When he assumed the throne in Syria, he was acclaimed by the West as a reformer, as somebody to watch closely. He was going to be good for the region and he was going to be good for... Um, uh, relationships between the countries in the area. All of this was said about Assad. By the way, before the so-called uprising in Syria in 2011, the United Nations was singing the praises of Syria in 2009 and 2010, saying that it had reached and surpassed its millennium goals. It was a great place, apparently. Now, Scott, we know from listening to the former French Foreign Minister, Dumas, that... Way back in 2008, plans were being put in place to destroy Syria. Let's be honest about that. Tell me this, Scott. Why didn't Bashar al-Assad know about that and do something about it? Well, Bashar al-Assad, uh, you know, obviously doesn't have the resources uh, that the West has when it comes to, you know, not only collecting intelligence, but analyzing it. You know, it's a very small country, has a very uh, uh, modest uh, um, GDP and they're uh, obviously not, you know, as powerful from uh, from an international perspective to second guess uh, the superpowers. Now, when it comes to the superpowers making these kinds of decisions, they didn't just do that to Syria. They did that to uh, Libya as well. The same scenario was played out against Libya. Libya was winning all kinds of great awards. They won the largest contract in the history of the United States, a $50 billion contract with ACOM. You know, they had uh, um, probably the best standard of living as good a standard of living as Russia, and uh, and certainly uh, um, uh, the best that Africa had ever seen, and this was a, a country that was on you know had you know decided it was going to work very well with the West. Uh, his son was working very well with England, and the United States was working very well. He's also working alongside the Chinese, so it was a very uh, um, successful component. And and same thing with Syria. The difference uh, um, uh, that that uh, saved Syria was obviously the UN vote. Uh, from uh, um, the Security Council between the Chinese and the Russians, uh, basically saying uh, no, no more no-fly zones for uh, for NATO because we know that will result in uh, the complete destruction of Syria, and Syria was the only base uh, that uh, uh, Russia had outside of its own territory, and and also you know China has also been a, a very close uh, uh, ally and uh, understands the. The pressure at which uh, that was applied to Libya and how unnecessary and uh, illegal that was. So I think what, what we had in the, you know in our history was uh, we had an opportunity whereby the the West was finally you know called on its game and uh, and then tried to, to do it you know subversively and covertly and you know but like you said Bashar al Assad he may not have seen it coming but boy when it did come he actually reacted to it in the right way. Very much like Gaddafi did. Gaddafi called it out uh, at the Arab League uh, prior to it happening, and he said, "I could be next," and certainly he was. He actually did predict it, and uh, um, and Assad, uh, um, you know, didn't take it as seriously. 
uh, because Assad is, like you said, he was very accustomed to the West. He lived in uh, um, in in England, and he also, I think, his wife was also British as well. So that's right. Yeah, he, he had a, he had a, a very good ties. He had he had, he had very uh, you know close relationships, and I think what happened is is that he got caught up, you know, when in the momentum of the of the fabricated Arab Springs and uh, and the uh, um, and the domino effect that was, that the uh, um, that the powers that were taking advantage of that. They thought this would be a good time to employ the Turks because the Turks absolutely wanted to uh, uh, get involved in uh, toppling Assad as well as regaining that territory on the uh, uh, south uh, eastern or western sides of the mountain ranges in uh, in Turkey. So it was a it was an opportunity for Turkey to gain. It was an opportunity for Saudi to gain. It was an opportunity for Israel to gain, and and it was also an opportunity to uh, provide a pipeline outside of Iraq uh, through Syria. Uh, whereby uh, that oil could be uh, brought directly to um, the uh, the Europeans without having to go around uh, the uh, uh, the Horn of uh, um, uh, of Africa, and also you know delaying that time and the cost of shipping it in those tankers. So there was a there was a massive amount of move strategically from a financial perspective. Uh, from you know obviously the Western financial markets are were failing. Uh, since 2008, by the way, and are still failing eight years later, and we're due for another major cliff. It happens about every eight years. So, so you know, obviously, you know, war is very um, uh, uh, good uh, at um, distracting individuals away from the financial fiasco. And if and if you look at the kinds of communications that are coming out of organizations like the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research, which is the Chatham House of Sweden. Uh, they are sending out financial communiques to all their most uh, wealthy customers at their uh, um, that they communicate with, just like the Brookings Institute and the Chatham House. And they're basically saying, watch everything, but de- get your get your money into the aerospace defense equipment. So if you take a look at this year's um, financial analysis, it's telling all the investors to invest in the uh, invest in the war because I think we're going to war. And I you know I I predict that we'll be you know, at a much larger scales of war. It's a one uh, economy uh, driver that, uh, that, that absolutely will, um, will shadow the, the, the horrible failure of the West. So, whether, so it, whether it's Hillary or whether it's Trump then, let's just discount Bernie Sanders as sure. a non-runner. So whether it's Hillary or whether it's Trump, I don't see Trump being usurped now by a run from Ted Cruz or a run from Rubio or a late challenge from Jeb Bush. I think it's looking increasingly likely, the bizarre reality is looking like Trump is going to be as a nominee. Either one of those well, gets well, in. Well, let's, let's, let's be clear how the electoral process works. In the primaries, he receives his, uh, um, he's, he's, he receives his electorates. Uh, when, when the electorates go to the other individuals who are running in second and third place, where the four or five, he's behind those four or five combined. So what will happen is that as they get a front runner in the uh, the second place, and this happens a lot in American elections, whoever's the front runner in the beginning can be superseded as the other people fall out. And as they fall out and endorse, none of them will endorse Trump, and they'll endorse somebody like Rubio or Bush or hopefully not Ted Cruz because he's very much like uh, Trump. But uh, you'll have a uh, um, you know most likely a Rubio uh, Bush ticket, and if you have Rubio and Bush on the same ticket. Their combined electoral votes alongside the ones that were uh, um, basically handed over from the other primaries by the candidates that drop out will be more than enough to uh, um, supersede uh, Trump in his uh, his uh, um, horrible, uh, you know, racist campaign. So I, I, I think people are, are jumping the gun on, uh, on Trump. I'm actually a delegate in the Republican Party in the state of Florida, sadly. My friends call me a pirate. <laughs> my friends call me a, my friends call me a pirate in Republican clothes, uh, but uh, um, I will I will be very honest with you to say that no one in, in my uh, um, uh, delegation would even consider voting uh, for uh, um, uh, Trump. I know, so but I, there's no there's no there's no viable alternative anyway because whatever people want to believe about Bernie Sanders, he's still an establishment uh, politician. He's unlikely to be. Ronald yeah, he'll, you know, he'll be very much. Yeah. He'll be very much like Obama, but he won't be as naive, and he'll have a, a lot better connections, and he'll be more effective at whatever initiatives he takes because he's he's not quite as stupid, but uh, um, but he will um, he will definitely uh, um, 
uh, be uh, very much pro-Israel Zionist, as he's proven he's done that. Yeah. Uh, he'll, the, he'll agenda, the, the agenda might appear to slow down if he got in, uh, but, but, but it won't be. And that's, that's the trick with guys like Obama. I've always believed that. Give people the illusion that a more uh, socially minded, um, you know, a more compassionate politician is coming in and it's going to be better for you. People fall for it. They are completely fooled by it. And it appears that the crazy agenda has slowed down, but it hasn't really, because behind the scenes it's all happening anyway. Look what's happened under the Obama um It's, it's reign, tremendously you know? accelerated. Yeah, 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 exactly. But 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 on the face of it, to a lot of Americans, they wouldn't see that. So here's the question. Either way, they're going to say, right, we got to uh, agree with the UAE, we've got to agree with the Saudis, and we've got to get in on the ground in Syria. Because Russia, it appears... And you quite rightly said that Assad was more capable than they believed he was in fighting uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the ISIS jihadists. But as well as that, Russia uh, coming into play in the last couple of months, they've really put a halt to the gallop of what the US and Britain and France wanted to see in Syria, haven't they? They've really, really, absolutely, in fact, it's going the other way. Russia's having great success there. And we know they are because now we're hearing lies uh, on cable news, lies about Russia not only bombing innocent people, but then returning to bomb uh, those people carrying the stretchers, coming yeah, to bomb yeah. the medics. Utter nonsense, with no it's proof the same, whatsoever. It's the same nonsense as as as, as uh, Assad barrel bombing his own people. So, with no yeah. proof offered as well. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So whoever gets in, we're going to have a big escalation in Syria. Yeah. Well, I think I think that you're right. I think one of those escalations. I mean, obviously. The Americans have armed the uh, Qataris, the United Arab Emirates, and the uh, uh, the Saudis uh, to the teeth. Uh, they have more equipment than they've ever had before, uh, and and they've been you know very instrumental in shipping that equipment to the uh, not only to the uh, mercenary forces hired to, to overthrow Assad, but also the mercenary forces to overthrow Gaddafi. So you know this is a, a very uh, a well orchestrated machine. Uh, the Russians have exposed a lot of it. You know, thankfully, you have uh, press TV and uh, um, and uh, Russia Today and radio stations like yourself. Uh, you know, uh, and 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 sadly, you know, if I mention any of these outlets uh, uh, in any of the meetings, the um, I go to the Wilson Center for uh, uh, World um, uh, uh, um, uh, Peace and I go to all of these different uh, meetings in uh, in Washington, D.C., and I. And I quote and I try to talk about things that are coming out in the news. And they say, oh, that's just a propaganda network. And I said, have you watched Fox News lately? And have you watched uh, <laughs> CNN? You know, that, let's talk about propaganda. Let's let's be really clear about this. I've been on these news agencies and not once have they ever cut what I said. Not once have they ever told me what to say. Not once have they ever called me and say, well, what would you say about this before they put me on? You know, so they're they're very. You know, uh, they're, they're, they give me a lot of leverage and I wish I could find an American mainstream network that would allow me to do this on. You know, they do not allow an opposition or a dissident voice. Uh, in fact, I think what they do, they 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 strategically cause these uh, quote unquote terror events in order to um, uh, delegitimize, you know, individuals who say this war on terror is, uh, you know, obviously a uh, um, uh, nothing more than a, a mask. Uh, that's used to uh, substantiate or legitimize a uh, an unnecessary military industrial complex that's just out of control. It's so lunacy, I, Scott. Do you know what? It's lunacy. I, I hate. Uh, you've just talked about not being interrupted, and you've just talked about being given time. And there I am interrupting. Uh, I don't no, need to no, do no, that. No, 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 no. I said cut. No, no. Yeah, no, yeah. Like, it's like only. Um, it's only. I'm, we've sure got... you won't, I'm sure you won't take this recording and cut out. Certain not pieces, at all. It, 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 <laughs> it, first of all, we're live, of course, and and we we won't touch the recording. It's twelve minutes to the top of the hour. Just want to mention a couple of quick emails. Jonathan is not happy with me disparaging. Uh, Bernie Sanders and he sent me a, a very loud email with big capital letters saying mm. that Sanders isn't an establishment guy, represent him correctly. If he gets elected and does nothing, then crucify him, but don't belittle him, please. Jonathan, I explained this last night, I thought rather eloquently. I am not up my own arse, as we say in Ireland. I don't have a massive ego and I don't know more than you know or anybody else, but I've been covering politics for 20 years. I've seen these people come and go, Anthony Blair, 
Barack Obama. I remember David Icke getting hammered in Los sure. Angeles a few years ago when Obama was the junior senator from Illinois and he was Martin Luther King, according to some people. I well, I tell you, a lot oh, of people Jesus. bought that hook, line, and a lot sinker. of they bought I, it. I, I, I had hope for him too. I yeah, gotta tell you. so did I. I did, I did. But these guys always amount to nothing, Jonathan. They wouldn't be there, mate. If they were going to make a difference, they wouldn't be there. That's my opinion on Sanders. But you're entitled to yours uh, as well. Now, I want to talk about... By the way, you can find Scott on Twitter. He's uh, quite simply at Scott underscore Rickard. At Scott underscore Rickard. I've uh, tweeted that out there as well. And is there a website you want to direct people to, Scott? No, no, I just, uh, I, I'd I didn't say, think you know, so. I, I yeah. like, I like, I like people to go back to the programs like yourself. You know, you're the, uh, there's so many great programs out there. There's ground zero with Clyde Lewis. There's Jack blood. Uh, he's got, uh, um, some great, uh, revolution radio stuff out there. You've got, uh, um, Sean Respitello. You've got, uh, uh Chuck Ocelli. You've got a lot of people probably on your side of the pond, you know, there's, yeah. There's so many um, other people that are, you know, doing a you know, fabulous job bringing on great guests like uh, <clears throat> Ray McGovern. Like you, Scott, and, this is what it's all about. A guy with your experience, it's a disgrace, it's an outrage that your opinions are not heard on national media in the United States. It's my job, and it's the only job I have, is to make sure that your opinion is heard. That's it. Uh, I appreciate stop. that. No, and the, and the people you mentioned as well, terrific people doing exactly uh, the same thing. Where is this going on? This uh, where is this going to all end up, uh, Scott? Left unchecked, left unchecked. If people don't get up off their arses, you know. Well, I I don't think it's gonna you know it's gonna die on a vine. I think, you know, what what we are talking about between you and I and these other you know individuals who are being more observant and re- reasonable and logical about this, it's it's really considered a fifth column, you know. And as the fifth column grows, and I believe it's growing, I I've I've, I've had. You know, nothing but great success, uh, despite the uh, the kinds of censorship that's going on on Facebook and despite the uh, the kinds of, uh, you know, they call it edge rank. I don't know if you're familiar with that algorithm, but as you, you know, you have about a half a million uh, subscribers on one of the networks that was associated with uh, the David uh, um network that you were at the, I think it was something like ITV or some some television network you guys were putting together. And and that had, you know, quite a bit of followers. And as you're, you know, you saw in as they started to change the algorithms, you'd post something and get a lot less likes, yeah, get a lot less yeah, shares. Yeah, and yeah. Got, Well, that was part of the edge rank algorithm that uh, what it did is it actually well, if you and I aren't conversing on Facebook and exchanging dialogue within our pages or our or our Facebook accounts, uh, we're not seeing each other's posts in our news feeds. So they, they basically controlled the news feeds whereby. They 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 uh, um, uh, limited the uh, the things that you would see in your news feed rather than just opening it up, and so you have to go back and manually reconfigure to set notifications for each account. And you know, most people just not only do they not have the time to do that, they just don't. They're not they're not as uh, a computer savvy to uh, um, you know take advantage of all the settings in their in the application. They have too many other things to concentrate. And we on. we have to be we have to be better at doing that. Najat from. Najat is from Yemen, but she's living in New York. Uh, mm-hmm. She's been on the program in the past when we've opened the phone lines to listeners. Uh, lovely to hear from you, Najat. She agrees with John, by the way. She says, Richie, you're wrong. When a candidate is marginalised, it means they are a threat to the system. Uh, they are cast out and underreported. She says that Bernie uh, Sanders is one of them. Thanks for your comment, Najat. Ian disagrees. He says they wouldn't be there if they were really outsiders. Outsiders outsiders even usually end up dead Mike Rivero was on the programme earlier on Ray McGovern was on this week um, planned financial crash Scott uh, Mike doesn't think it'll be planned I suspect only on what I've read and learned over the last years I'm no researcher like you I suspect there is a massive massive crash financial crash planned and it'll be used as a pretext for further uh, unbearable, brutal austerity. We even had the international. Uh, we even had the Institute of Fiscal Studies say in Britain the other day that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, is a liar. That his plans won't work. That he has to bring in even more austerity. Are we going to have? Are there some bad times ahead, Scott? If we don't do something. Well, when you say we, unfortunately, the United States has not had to participate in any austerity. So. They know better than to hit the pocketbooks of the Americans because I think they'd see an uproar 
the Americans have had uh, very much carte blanche on being able to write a check uh, every six months or so, so for as much as a trillion uh, or uh, 700 billion. I think the last one was six or 700 billion. And I like to put that in perspective. Uh, last month, uh, Barack Obama signed a yet another budget uh, increase for uh, seven or 800 billion or six or 700 billion. And when he did that, let's put this into perspective. Greece is asking for two billion and Greece is a 10 million population whereby the United States is just roughly 300 million, we're asking, which is 30 times that, we'd be asking for 60. And we have to pay no austerity for it. In fact, uh, we, a- we actually got more than 10 times the 60. We got over 600 billion, and, we didn't, and it didn't cost us a dime. You know, and we just put another log on the fire on our uh, un- unpayable debt uh, to, the, uh, um, to these financial um, you know, uh, wizards who are uh, um, doing nothing more than pocketing, lining their own pockets uh, with a, uh, you know, basically vapor money that doesn't exist. Uh, so I think it's very unfair that the United States continues to operate alongside uh, many of the other European uh, country, countries that have found it more easy. Uh, but unfortunately, countries like Ireland and countries like Portugal and Greece are at the at the uh, at the end of the uh, the rope and have absolutely no um, uh, uh, recourse and have to continue to beg uh, for just minute amounts of money uh, comparatively for what the United States has just given carte blanche. Unless, it, unless 150 or 200 or 300,000 people say enough's enough, Scott. This is the killer because the answer is so simple, non-violent civil disobedience, but people massing in the capital cities of their countries and gently and non-violently um, taking over those institutions. I know people are terrified. Well, what would we do then? Who would be well, in charge it, it, and all it, that? It's, it's come close a couple of times, yeah. you know, but, but unfortunately they get usurped. I, I guess I'll use Greece as another example. They've probably done the best at uh, mobilizing. You know, obviously Egypt had a, uh, you know, historically one of the largest. Uh, they had about 10% of their society, over 7 million uh, during the uh, Tahrir Square uh, were, um, were protesting. But in Greece, you know, they've gotten to that number as well. Ten percent of their society, about a million, uh, were protesting, and uh, and they they were somewhat successful at getting a, uh, um, a party down the middle uh, with uh, Syriza. Uh, but it turns out that uh, that that particular party also sold out to the international bankers. You know, fired their finance minister and uh, ended up selling out, and uh, has not you know come through for the people. So. You know, it's a struggle and it's a struggle that, you know, much like maybe the Commonwealth Wars, you know, 500 years ago uh, may may happen. But uh, but it's not it's 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 a rarity. It's not it's not as common as it is rare. Scott, I tell you what, that um, that's about where we've got to leave it because uh, time is against us. We've Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to wrap the program up. I want to mention again, uh, Scott can be found at Scott underscore Rickard on Twitter. Follow him. He's got uh, several thousand followers there already, but follow him because uh, he tweets regularly. He's always sharing really interesting articles and really interesting points of view. Uh, fascinating, Scott, to have somebody like you on the program. Worked for, um, you know, the NSA and worked for the US Air Force and others. Really enjoyed having you on. Uh, it was about time, really, when you think about it. You should have been on the program before. Uh, as I say... Uh, from time to time, and I do mean it when I do say it. Stay in touch and don't wait to be invited back on again. Keep in touch with me and let me know when something is happening that we need to know about and you'll always have an open door to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Richie. Well, thanks for doing it, my friend. Look after yourself. Likewise, you too. Be safe, man. Marvellous. Scott Rickard on the line to us there uh, from uh, from his home. And uh, that was terrific. Uh, absolutely incredible. Came was researching the program in the week, and this is a true story. And you talk about, you talk about synchronicity sometimes. And I'd seen Scott speaking on various channels. I've seen him talking on cable news in America. I've seen him on RT, and I've seen him elsewhere. And I knew Ray was coming on, and I said, I must ask Scott uh, uh, to come on the program later on in the week. And I was thinking about that, and I swear on all that's sacred... No sooner had I got my diary and written in a, a personal note, a reminder, as it were, to get him on, than he sent me a friend request on Facebook. It's uncanny. And I burst out laughing, and I accepted his friend request, and I messaged him back and I said, 
we don't know each other, but you'll never believe this. I was actually thinking about finding a way to get in touch with you when you sent me that friend request. That's a true story. It's uh, bizarre, but it, it actually happened.